Hello, this is Dr. Greer, and I'm excited this week to talk to you about chapters 13 and 14. We're going to start today on situational influences, and then we're going to move on to chapter 14, which has some other interesting stuff on problem recognition. So let's go ahead and just jump right into chapter 13. We are in that decision process now. We've moved on from self-concept and lifestyle. We're going to stay in that a little bit, but we're going to move into decision process in this consumer decision framework that we've been using this whole time. <clears throat> so first off, I'm going to define situational influence, and then we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk about how to use situational influence as marketers. Um, so let's just start. Situational influence includes all those factors particular to a time and place that do not follow from a knowledge of stable attributes of the consumer and the stimulus and that have an effect on current behavior. So consumers often behave very differently depending on situations. That's a good summary of it. So we're going to talk about this more in this chapter. But if I was to say, what are you going to eat on Friday night with your friends versus a Sunday brunch with your family? Those might be different things that you're looking for, hence the term situational influence. Um, we, we don't always know as marketers what's going to be happening around that, but we can plan for that. Uh, if I was to be marketing champagne, I probably wouldn't be marketing champagne as a lunch item. It'd probably be more around a celebration. But then again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe every lunch should be a celebration. Like those are the kinds of things that we need to think about as marketers and make sure that we put ourselves into that situation that we're, we might be having um, influence over. So the situation comes up and there's different characteristics that are surround it. Our marketing activities need to match up with what's going on there and then that lends itself to those individual characteristics that we've talked about before, leading to what the person's going to do. So um, if you're gonna go golfing with your friends versus golfing by yourself, are you going to impress them with your golf balls or is the golf ball important to you only? Like there's lots of interesting questions around things like that. If you're gonna go play basketball with a group of guys, do you really care about what you're wearing? Like do you have Nikes on, Adidas? Like, do you get dressed up a little bit, even though it still might be athletic wear? Or if you're just going to go shoot hoops by yourself, do you do the same type of thing? Like, these are good questions we can have because the situation changes the dynamic of what the consumer is going to be doing. <clears throat> so there's four basic types of situations and situational influence, according to this text, that we want to look at. The communication situation, the purchase situation, the usage situation, the disposition. So communication situations, pretty basic stuff. A uh, communication situation is one where they get to know like um, if you as a marketer are selling uh, your a a favorite sports team's memorabilia and they just lost a game, do you think it's going to affect that? So you might be communicating at the wrong time for what that person wants or needs. However, you could flip that around and say, okay, the team just won the Super Bowl and you're going to run that ad that always happens right after the Super Bowl where the person or where the company is selling the Patriots gear or the Falcons gear or the, you know, whatever team it is that they have that gear right there for. So that's one situation. The next situation is called the purchase situation. And it always dep depends on the purchase situation is a pretty fascinating one because um, let's say you get to the store, you pick out your item and you go get in line and there's a massive line. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's not worth it for me to wait this line. I'm going to put this back and go. Or let's just say you're in a bad mood. Um, let's say your friend tells you that that's a bad brand. Those are purchase situations. We don't have a lot of control over that as marketers, but we want to make sure that we can somehow identify that and just understand that there's an influence happening from a situation. <clears throat> Next one is the usage situation. Uh, usage situation is... For instance, um, at, at dinner on a cold, stormy evening. That's a great one, where maybe what maybe you're gonna want soup instead of steak, uh, or instead of salad. Um, what if you're feeling sad or homesick? Maybe there's something comforting that you wanna go purchase. Um, the perfect example is, you know, what are you, well, what are you gonna drink if you're out with your friends on a Friday night or with your family on a Tuesday afternoon? You know, those are different things. Are you going to go get a Red Bull or are you going to have, you know, a Coke or something like that? Like there's just different pieces based on the usage of what's going on um, that happen. And then finally is the disposition one. 
And this disposition station uh, situation is how easy is it to dispose of what you're having them purchase? So if someone buys a can of soda, here we go, a little Fresca. Ah, I love my Fresca. Someone buys a can of soda and they're in the mall and they see a trash can, they're getting ready to throw it away, but there's no recycle bin. Does that make them want to buy that next time? Or maybe it's a bottle of water. Uh, I think that we've all been influenced. Does anybody have an, uh, do you have a hydro flask? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, is it considered uncouth to be drinking out of a bottle of water now? Like these are all situations that are, are pretty fascinating that influence people's purchases. So situations can be described on a number of different dimensions, uh, which determine their influence on consumer behavior. And there's five key dimensions or characteristics. And so one is physical surroundings, number two is social surroundings, number three is temporal perspectives, number four is task definitions, and then number five is antecedent states. Now we're gonna talk mostly about one, we're gonna hit a little bit on three here. You can read all about it in the chapter, but I just wanna go through a couple of these things really quick and start off with physical surroundings. So when we look at physical surroundings, we're talking about what is the atmosphere of the store? What's the sum of all the physical features of the retail environment that you might be in? Um, and, and I would even pivot this into what's the, the feel of the online store, if you're looking at it from that way. Um, you can look at this also digitally, what kind of physical characteristics, but I would say digital characteristics are happening in the surrounding store. Uh, I want to give you a quick example. I think I might have shared this in the live class. Um, but when Apple decided to open up stores, everybody thought they were crazy. And they got Ron Johnson, the CEO of Target. They hired him to be the Apple store um, guru. And Steve Jobs came to him and said, okay, I heard you're the best guy for this. Let's build this store. And Ron Johnson said, well, hold on you wouldn't build a product without prototyping it. We need to prototype the store. And Steve Jobs thought that was totally foreign. <clears throat> so they went in San Jose, they, rent, they purchased this massive warehouse. And inside they built four Apple stores. And they built them from the ground up, everything exactly as it would be in an Apple store in a mall. And he and Steve Jobs would go over there and walk through the different stores. They were completely furnished. They had all the products, they had everything in them. They wanted to get the look and feel. They finally got what they wanted and they opened up the first one. I think the first one was in Virginia, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong on that. But on the day of the opening, they had all the press come out. They took all these pictures. They introduced the store. It was a big hullabaloo. And they left. And on the floor was all this Italian marble and everybody's shoes had marked it up with black spots, like black streaks all over it. And as the saying goes, this is kind of legend at, uh, at Apple, Steve had the entire design team flown out or bust over wherever they were, and they made them get on their hands and knees and clean it. And his whole point was he didn't want workers cleaning that store like that every night to keep it pristine. So naturally the design team that came up with this started figuring out how to put in floors that were beautiful but wouldn't scuff. <laughs> and he was, that, he was that attentive to the atmospherics of the store. <clears throat> so a lot of times if you go into a store and I, I like to compare like a Kmart versus a Walmart versus a Target, those are pretty good. Like Kmart feels a little low class because the lights aren't even on. Walmart seems a little bit better, but still maybe not as high end as a Target. Or Nordstrom's, you can go even further. Like you can walk in and kind of get the feel of a store right away. Um, so atmosphere is referred to as service gate. So when, when you look at a service business, such as a hospital, a bank, or a restaurant, it's like, what does it feel like when I come in here? If you go into a hospital and you're like, oh, this place is dirty. Or you go into a restaurant and you're like, oh, this is really nice and clean. It, it's bright or it feels like a Tuscan villa or something like that. There's a bunch of different things that help influence the way you look at stuff. Now, when we look at the type of service environments or the typology, we have a little matrix here that shows utilitarian to hedonic, hedonic sorry, and short, moderate, and extended, how much time people spend in there. So utilitarian short amount of time is a dry cleaner. You walk in, you know, you kind of smell it. I've been to some pretty low-end dry cleaners, but you're just there to 
get your dry cleaning done, right? And so it's a, it's a washing spot for your clothes. Or the bank, a lot of times people, um, you go into a bank, there's a Wells Fargo over here on State Street that I go into, and I'm like, man, they need to update the inside of this bank. Versus if you went on a cruise, you're much more particular about if you're gonna be there for a long time and it, it needs to have all the things around it that you want to have, make you feel comfortable. Um, so these are just different ways of looking at things. Now, we've done a lot of conferences I'm at doTERRA and sometimes you go into one of our venues and it's just amazing. We did uh, a conference at the San Diego Convention Center up at the top floor. It has these massive sails. Those the ceiling is massive and high. There's sunlight coming in all the time. It was beautiful. And then I also did one in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. No bash on Monroeville, but it was pretty. The conference center was pretty dark. The ceilings were short. It just had a massive difference. And in fact, we did um, a conference in Atlanta and a conference in San Diego a couple years ago the sales of the merchandise that we had at the events with the same amount of people were double in San Diego that they were in Atlanta. Double. All the same products, all the same everything. It was just the physical surroundings of people that were there that really influenced that. So that's a big deal and I think we just need to always remember that. Now there's a couple different things that we can look at when we're looking at physical surroundings. Colors are important, aromas, music, and crowding. So it it, all of that plays into a, like the, the user's thought of, is this a good place to be? Is it a pleasant place to be? Is it somewhere that I feel conducive to spending money? Well, I'm gonna show you something about a restaurant here in a second, but um, if you've ever been to a large conference center and all the draping is black, or all the draping is white, I'm not telling you which one's better, but they have a definitive feel about them. <clears throat> if you go, whenever I go to do uh, consulting, I always like to bring up lights and I have a couple banners that go up when I train on leadership and stuff like that. And it's fascinating to me if I just walk in a room and don't do anything, it's the same content, same exact content. And people aren't as engaged as when I bring 10 up lights and I put them up and so there's a red and a blue and a green, different things happening around. And I have a couple different banners that I pull up that have some stuff on them and it just elevates the whole room. And it's, so that's always fascinating to me. Uh, whenever I present, I always I have a specific playlist that I ask to get played ahead of time. I'm very aware and cognizant of the music that I play uh, prior to speaking because I think it really uh, sets the tone for what's happening. And then when we talk about crowding, it's like how many people do you have in a certain area? And you know, it typically if you have too many people it creates a negative feeling. Sometimes it can be positive. Maybe it creates that group culture. But these are just important characteristics when we're thinking about like retail environments or any space that we're trying to do some marketing at. So uh, just as an example, the impact of background music on restaurant, uh, on restaurant patrons here is a good study that was done in 1986, it's a long time ago. But with slow music playing in the background and fast music playing in the background, the service time to get their food was actually two minutes faster with fast music. Customer time at the table was actually cut by 11 minutes. And in a business where you're trying to turn tables, that can be very important. Customer groups leaving before seating, if there was fast music, they would leave faster. So there's a negative potentially, right? The amount of food purchased was just, it was, what is that, 60 cents less, approximately 70 cents less, uh, 69 cents less of uh, food was purchased. And amount of bar purchases was lower and the estimated gross margin was lower. So if you were a restaurant, would you play slow music or fast music? Well, according to the study, I would say monetarily, it probably makes a little bit more sense to be playing slow music, even though the service time was a little bit slower, even though it was a little bit longer, you were making more money per table. So I would just say that's an interesting one. Now, when we talk about temporal perspectives or time, okay, this deals with the effect of time on consumer behavior. So uh, I always like to say fear of missing out or scarcity is one of those things that really ratchets people up. Have you ever had a deal that you're like, I've got to get this deal. If I don't get this deal, I'm going to lose it and I'm never going to have that great of a deal again. If you stop and take a breath, just breathe. Inhale, exhale, and breathe. <laughs> 
you realize it's, let's just say it's a $50 savings. Uh, if it was a $400 item, you're gonna save 100 bucks. You're rushing into something. Um, you know, I think this is a very powerful tool that we have is time as marketers. We need to be very careful when we use it, but it's also one of the most effective things that we can do. We can create a needed urge for someone to purchase something if we do it pro uh, properly. So internet shopping is growing rapidly because a lot of people don't want to go to the store. I'm one of those people. I typically was like, oh, just yesterday I was thinking I need an ethernet cable. I could have driven to Best Buy and paid 20 bucks for it, but I got on Amazon and I paid $12 for it and it's gonna come next week. But even then, I don't have to drive over to Best Buy, so I'm happy. I think that's a, just one of those things that's happening right now in the world is that internet shopping is becoming more and more powerful because of the time aspect. Then we can move into task definition. So it's, it's the reason the consumption activity is occurring. Now, it could be that you're purchasing something for yourself versus a gift. Okay, so if you're gonna purchase a gift, I bought my brother-in-law a pickleball paddle uh, for Christmas and I really struggled with which one was good enough. Is he gonna be mad if I don't get him one that's the right thing? Turns out I bought him a nice one. He didn't even know anything about pickleball paddles. He just liked playing it. He was just thrilled that he, you know, he had his own paddle. <laughs> so I actually spent a lot of time and effort and stress on something that was probably not that big of a deal to him. But um, I had a friend at one point, uh, still my friend, but we don't do this as much anymore, where we would gift each other massive things, <laughs> thousands of dollars. <clears throat> and we did that so that we could tell our wives that we got it as a gift, but then we would have to reciprocate it. And so, you know, I would do something for him, he would do something for me. It was a little fun game that we had. Now, you know, there's just, what's the feeling? What's the, what's, you know, what is the meaning behind that? And so task definition can really talk about, you know, why is this occurring at this point? So let's final, let's talk about antecedent states and we'll talk about rituals a little bit here. But antecedent states <clears throat> are important because it's the mood, it's the momentary condition. It's, you know, what, what am I feeling and does it make me want to buy? Now that's not necessarily a marketing person's um, purview to create that, but it is something that we have to be thinking about. Now, if someone's tired or ill or, or they have extra money or they're broke, like these are momentary conditions. So these, these states that people are in, we can use those to create a buying opportunity. Um, if you're, you know, if you're not feeling your best and you need to uplift your, your mood, maybe you have a caffeinated beverage or maybe it's vitamin emergency or whatever they call that. We can get products that can help with certain moods. <clears throat> Ritual situations. Um, I'm getting to the point where I have to actually be thinking about weddings. My kids, I have a 21 year, well, he'll almost, he's 20 and I have an 18 year old. And I'm scared to death they're both gonna get married soon. <laughs> and I've been thinking, okay, like what's the expectation? <clears throat> one is my son, one is my daughter, she's 18, of when they get married, like how big of a party are we gonna have? Where is it gonna be located? What's my wife's, you know, what's my wife's expectation gonna be of that? What is the my in-law's expectation of that gonna be? Um, this can create like, is it a two thousand dollar cake? or is it a $100 cake, or is it a $20 cake? You know, like, these are all things that come up. And, and there's a social definition of something that creates a behavior. Like, do I need to go get a tux? Um, do we need to have a party? These are important because marketers can look at that and say, all right, how am I going to influence this moment for this person? And it, it can be totally different for everybody. So what we wanna do is we wanna identify different situations that might involve the consumption of a product. Like if it's a time, a place, an activity, a mood, um, and then we wanna determine which products or brands are most likely to be purchased or consumed across those situations. And one of the ways that we can do this is jointly scale situations and products. I'm gonna show you an example. This is like a business 101 graph, business school 101 graph. So we have you know, usage at home versus away from home versus concern for yourself and concern for others. And when we look at this, we see, okay, 
Um, use situation one is to clean my mouth upon rising in the morning. And use situation number two is before an important business meeting late afternoon. Now, when I wake up, am I using mint flavored candy gum to clean my mouth? No, I'm using that because I'm gonna go see somebody and I wanna have fresh breath. Okay? It doesn't mean that we don't wanna brush our teeth or use toothpaste. It's just a different usage situation. So if I was marketing mint flavored gum, I'm not gonna show somebody rolling out of bed and putting gum in their mouth. I'm probably gonna show them meeting a, a, a significant other or a business person. Some kind of situation where they feel like they need to um, impress someone and that's, you know, maybe that's why I have it packaged a certain way so they can get to it very simply. So there's five basic steps uh, for developing situational based marketing strategies. And, um, and essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a matrix around this. And I'll show you this in one second. But these five steps are to use observational studies. Make informed guesses is what I would say. You can then go into focus groups, go into depth interviews or secondary data. We have a place called Mintel that we use to get research here at doTERRA. And then once you get your idea, what you do is you test that idea through a survey. So the first phase is more qualitative. Yes, qualitative. The second phase is more quantitative. So you're going to actually test what your theory is through a large group of people, see what the responses are. And then you're going to construct a person situation segmentation matrix, which I'll show you in one second. And then you're going to evaluate each cell in terms of their potential. And then you're going to develop and implement a marketing strategy for those cells that offer sufficient profit potential for your, for your capabilities. Now, if you aren't paying attention to what I just said, that was a brilliant idea on how to create some really good, powerful marketing, and you could guide that in your career. So you might want to be thinking about this because this is pretty much how some really smart people do work in the real world. So you would have to create something like this. This is for person situation segments for suntan lotions. You'd say, okay, beach boat activities, home pool sunbathing, tanning booths, snow skiing, personal benefits. Uh, then you have young children, teenagers, adult women, adult men, general situations and benefits. And then you go fill in all that information. Now you, you could say, okay, preventing sunburn works across all of these things. And on boat activities though, we have a container that floats. So you might wanna create a, you know, don't do this, do this, you know, protect yourself from the sun. Everybody's in the water, everybody's at the beach. And then somebody's putting some sunscreen on and it gets knocked out of their hands and starts floating. Like that would be a good ad campaign. And you would probably focus that in on beach areas or boat buyers or something like that where you can really hit those people that are the ones who are gonna be purchasing. And you can go back into previous chapters and say, okay, who's the user and who's the purchaser? And I would say that's one of the more fascinating things. Okay, is it gonna be the women that are purchasing it or the men? And where are you gonna go put your message? How are you gonna have that? Is it teenagers buying it? I doubt it's gonna be teenagers or young children, but they are users, so maybe you don't want to burn their eyes if it gets in their eye. There's all these fascinating things that we could do with these different situations. So that's chapter 13, Situational Influences. I really recommend you go read this. This is all gold that you're gonna be able to use for the rest of your life in your marketing um, future. Let me go ahead and jump into chapter 14. Chapter 14 is decision process and problem recognition. And so as we start looking at consumers identifying a problem, and this is an interesting one because at some point, typically a consumer says, okay, I need to fill a gap in my life. We're over in this decision process section here on this. So we're gonna talk about the impact of purchase involvement on decision process. And then we're gonna talk about how to use that. Now, purchase involvement is the level of concern for or interest in the purchase process, triggered by, a, by need to consider a particular purchase. And so it's a temporary state influenced by the interaction of individual product or situational characteristics. Who, what, what, what does that mean, Dr. Greer? <coughs> Excuse me. That means that we can have a high involvement or a low involvement purchase. High involvement means it's gonna take some time, some effort, and some energy to decide what I'm gonna get. These are typically things like, um, we all come up with these, but like golf, makeup. There's a lot of things that people put a lot of time and effort into before they purchase something because they wanna make sure that they get the right thing versus a low per involvement purchase, which is like really quickly, I'm gonna look for something, I'm gonna grab it really quick and go. Now, 
this is one of the more um, interesting concepts in consumer behavior because like for instance I I'm working from home now while I'm supposed to be uh, but I am looking for a new webcam I'm looking for a new monitor so I don't just go to Best Buy and buy the first one of each of those I want a 3840 by 2160 27 to 32 inch monitor that has a USB-C connection that works with my MacBook Pro and by golly I want a Logitech Brio 4k webcam because I need to look awesome when I'm doing all this telecommuting and I have put a lot of time effort and energy into those and I haven't bought either of those yet because I'm in that information search category where I'm trying to see okay what matches with what I'm trying to accomplish so that's a very high involvement purchase that's high value you know these monitors are anywhere from 600 bucks to fourteen hundred dollars as much as I don't care about money I care about that kind of money it's just built into me I want to get the right thing and I want to buy the wrong thing um, now there's three different types of decision making so nominal limited and extended and nominal decisions are typically um, they're either repeat purchases like you don't think where you're gonna go out to eat typically you just go somewhere I walk to Costa Vida almost every day of my life and eat at Costa Vida for lunch because it's close to doTERRA I get a discount I enjoy their food I know what I like there so if you like Cafe Rio you're wrong I'm just kidding um, it's just what happens to be close I also have a Panda Express a Paul's Place and a uh, Mobetas over there and a slab pizza and you know what every once in a while I go frequent those but typically I just go to the same place over and over again I think we're all creatures of habit uh, now in this, the nominal decision making is a habitual decision making process so a lot of people for instance go to the store and they just buy Campbell's soup if they're buying a soup because they believe that it's right they won't even consider the generic off-brand doesn't matter price doesn't matter look quality whatever they just typically are gonna go with Campbell's um, so if I was in San Diego and I needed to go out to eat and I needed to be quick I'd probably go to Jack in the Box just because that was my default choice there I like Jack in the Box um, I didn't like McDonald's as much didn't love Wendy's but I mean I'd go to Wendy's but Jack in the Box is a pretty good like every single time I'll go there and have that now when we look at limited decision making this involves internal and a limited external search with few alternatives and simple decision rules on a few attributes and when we think about it a little bit afterwards so it involves recognizing a problem for which there are several possible solutions now um, I'm trying to come up with a good example if you're looking for I think they're talking about the cheapest rolls like Pillsbury rolls if you're not buying Pillsbury rolls all the time you want to make biscuits and gravy you might go to the store and think about this for a little bit but it's not going to be one of those things that tortures you you're going to like see it you're going to be like okay am i going to get the buttermilk ones or am i getting plain ones what is it pillsbury is it the store brand you're going to go through and figure that out but you might just do a quick internet search and see what people like but it won't be too much of that stuff outside um, and then finally when we're talking about extended decision making this is usually involves extensive internal and external searching followed up by a complex evaluation of multiple alter alternatives um, there's a it's a response to the high level of purchase involvement that's going on and a lot of times emotional decisions may involve substantial cognitive effort so if you've ever gone to buy a ring um, you have to learn about the four C's if you're if you're a guy you're like okay I need to make sure I hit the right four C's and get the right side you know color clarity quality and carrot I need to get all those I think those are still them and uh, and you know you want to make sure that you have your your wonderful soon-to-be wife feel the love that you feel for her and so you want to make sure you get the right cut and all these different things there's just a lot of different pieces to getting a ring or a monitor let's just say or golf clubs or maybe you're looking to purchase a car some of these things take a lot of time and effort to do for a lot of people now when we look at this process that people typically go through there's two ways to start it. typically it's the desired consumer lifestyle or their current situation and so if you're gonna go buy a car because your car broke down and you have to have one or you're just deciding you want to upgrade to an Audi those are different places in the world where you are 
And so it would go through, you know, what's my actual state? Where do I want to be? What's the nature of the discrepancy? What's the difference between where I want to be and where I uh, wish to be perceived as? And then it's going to help me decide whether or not I need to go do a lot of searching. So this is a good little uh, model to look at to see how people think. And, and there are different types of problems that we have as consumers. So first one is we have an active problem and we have an inactive problem. Active problem is one the consumer is aware of or will become aware of um, in, an, in a normal course of events. So it only requires that we, the marketing person, convince the consumer that our brand is superior. People are gonna buy soup. If they need soup, they're gonna like find a brand. Do you like Campbell's Chunky or Progressive? What's your take? <laughs> I personally buy a lot of Progressive, but I like Campbell's Chunky. So, you know, like I could be swayed usually on price on either one of those to decide which one I'm going to get. On an inactive problem, this is where the consumer is not aware they have a problem. So we have to actually inform them that they have a problem and then that we have a brand that solves the problem. So this is one of those things that it's a little more complicated, but it's fine. Um, you know, sometimes plumbing is something that we know we have a problem, but other times you could say, do you have low water pressure? That could be caused by your pipes. And, and so you see, we've just helped them. If somebody's like, yeah, I do have low water pressure. I didn't realize that. I should be getting way more water pressure. You're like, and so we have a solution for that by, you know, coating your pipes in your home so you're not losing water pressure. And we do it so perfectly. So our brand is starting to like really have a, a lot of, um, thought go into that along with letting them recognize the problem and that our brand has the answer. So there's a lot of non-marketing factors that go in and affect problem recognition. The first and foremost is, is there a desired state and what's the actual state? So the actual state is influenced by past decisions, normal depletion, product brand performance, individual development, emotions. Have you ever owned a car and that car was so great that you want to buy another one? Or have you ever owned a car that was so bad that you're like, I'm never going to touch that brand ever again? This is what happens in a lot of people's lives on this actual state, right? They get emotions and past decisions that were made with a brand performance. But then we get to the desired state. And we're like, okay, I have emotions over here. I have the situation over here. That's all there. But culture might have something to do with it. Social status. might. You want a VW or do you want an Audi? Or do you want a Porsche? Or do you want a Mercedes? Those are all German cars. But like, what level of culture does that say about you? What's the social status that you're talking about? So when we're, when we're trying to use this as a strategy, we need to discover consumer problems. We need to learn how to respond to, uh, to consumer problems, then help them recognize problems, and then suppress problem recognition. So we're going to talk about those. Um, when we are jumping into the incredible opportunity that we have, to help people discover consumer problems. We can identify consumer problems using online social media. Uh, we can monitor and tracking is not enough for this and problems need to be solved in a timely and appropriate manner. Now, I would say you have to get out of the building. Um, and, and I think some of this is in some ways more product marketing. And you'll learn this as you go through your career. There's a, usually a marketing department and a product marketing department um, in larger companies at least. Product builds things to solve a consumer problem. Marketing comes in and says, this is how we're gonna talk about it. But it's all informed by what are the key strategies and thoughts and what was the, the genesis of the idea. And so if you get some of this data from the product team, it's usually one of those things that really helps you become an effective marketer. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, we wanna discover it. You have to get outside of the, the building. You have to actually start talking to your consumers and seeing what they want. I think that's a hard thing. Now, if you were to ask somebody what they wanted, um, Henry Ford famously said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they'd say they wanted a faster horse, not a car. Sometimes you have to invent something that's different than what they're claiming, but that's why you need to know what the problem is that they're trying to solve, as the consumer's trying to solve. So we have three different approaches that we can take um, to solve you know, or to discover what consumer problems are. So we can have activity analysis, product analysis, and problem analysis. When we are um, looking at that, we typically want to just see like what are they doing or how are they doing it or how are they using it and then what is the big problem that someone might be having. That's a good way to just wrap those up. 
So when we look at human factor research in discovering consumer consumption, we want to do observational techniques. Um, we want to look at and research on what are the functional problems that consumers are aware of. And, and this can have, you know, does it hurt? There's a great movie. Great movie. I highly recommend you go watch it. It's called Objectified. Okay, Objectified. And it's about the whole concept of how people in product teams develop the things that we use every day. Um, you know, how is my iPhone case built? Like, why does it have an Apple logo here? Why are these buttons? Why is it leather? And why are these buttons right here? Why are they depressing? They're not part of the case. They're actually a mechanical piece of it. Um, on my wireless charger right here, what's the angle? Why is this the angle for the wireless charger? Why wasn't it three degrees higher? Was it, you know, 45 degrees? What was it? You know, like all those things, people think about them. And those are the human factors of research. They come in there. Then we have the emotional research that goes into this. So it's just like, how do you feel about this? What is your thought? This can help us, you know, what color do you like? Um, I like to tell the story that on my website, on when I had a, uh, an online business, the color of the arrow, it was like a 30% change in click-throughs if I just changed arrow from blue to red, I believe was the two colors. And so I was always one split test, but you could split test and say, okay, if I just make this color a little bit differently, what's the emotional response and what's the, the benefit of that? And then when we have to respond, we have to say, okay, maybe there's an issue with something that they're doing. How do we fix it? And this is, you know, once again, more of like a product team. They're trying to figure out, okay, how do I structure this in a way that I can repair the issue that's going on? Um, in my previous company at Certiport, one of the things which uh, I worked at Pearson Certiport, uh, loved that my entire time there it was a fantastic company but we had a, a program that was installed on everybody's computers and i used to say it was the testing software i used to tell them that they'd make you re-download everything every time instead of doing something called a delta update and i came from a college that had limited resources and so like just getting that all to work was always a big pain so I used to use a term called, I would say it was the greatest theft of bandwidth that I'd ever seen because when we needed to update everything, it was these massive files that would have to come across. And instead of Pearson solving that problem, they were putting it on the consumer. And I was trying to explain to them like the consumer, this is like, it might not be a big deal to your development team, but I came from that world. I was the consumer, so I knew what it was. I'm like, if you could change anything, it would be fixing that one piece would revolutionize everything. So I think they've done that by now. Um, I left before that got completed, but um, great company, uh, fun things to see, but it's a consumer problem that they were trying to solve at the time. So um, when we look at, well, as we're wrapping up here, how do we use these things? How do we help them recognize problems? And we can, you know, there's generic and there's selective. So generic problem recognition involves a discrepancy that a variety of brands within a product category can reduce. Increasing generic problem recognition generally results in an expansion of the total market. Whereas a selective product recognition involves a discrepancy only one brand can solve. This is why Apple phones are the best. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, firms attempt to cause selective problem recognition to gain market and maintain market share. I will say like Face ID on Apple was a big deal. They used that for a long time. They still say it's super secure and um, it's a better product. And so they have ads that go out about um, the security that happens when you just look at something and it unlocks it. Um, and then occasionally, information is introduced in the marketplace that triggers problem recognition that some marketers prefer to avoid. We don't want to look at it. So we don't want people to recognize our current problems. Um, this is pretty... If you're competing with someone, this is a pretty dastardly thing to do, is to start pointing out their flaws. I'm much more in the positive aspect. I like to talk about the pros of my products that I represent. I'm at Goterra right now, and I would never, um, we do some comparison stuff, but we would never attack, I think, is a philosophy that I would use one of our competitors because they're in the same space. We, we like having people in the oil business. We want to be the premier oil company, but it's not that we want to tear down other oil companies. 
So I think it's just interesting when, when that happens and when someone goes after another company, it's just kind of an indicator of how vicious that company is. And I would say as a marketer, you're gonna do very well in, you can do very well taking down people, but I think just as a default, it would always be good to talk positively about your product versus ripping somebody else's down. So those are the two chapters for this week. I hope you're doing okay. Um, I'm so excited that we're able to have this opportunity to talk. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I hope everything's going well, and I can't wait to see you next week. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you very much.